Okay, we have the, the third lecture about the CMB by Raphael Flauger. Okay. So there wasn't that much time between the, the lecture this morning and now, so maybe, and you haven't had a chance to look at anything, think about anything, so maybe I should ask if there's questions about the previous lecture. Uh, some of the stuff we'll look at again, so the part we did toward the end we'll, we'll look at again, but if you have questions about anything, anything else, just feel free to ask. Okay, so what we talked about in the uh, previous lecture for some time was the, the effects of our motion with respect to the cosmic microwave background, and after that we started talking about the primary anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background, and the goal was to eventually calculate the angular power spectrum of these primary anisotropies. And we said that we start our calculation at a temperature that should be um, at a time when, the C when you know that the CMB is a black body spectrum, but not too high so you don't complicate your life. So you typically start at a temperature of below 10 to the 9 Kelvin when electrons and positrons have annihilated and you have a universe that's filled with electrons and some protons and some, some helium nuclei, some neutrinos, some photons, and then some uh, cold dark matter and maybe dark energy. And the question was now, how do we describe this uh, system or how do we derive a, a system of equations that describes the, the universe at uh, temperatures of 10 to the 9 Kelvin and below? And we started focusing on the, the photons, and we'll continue, we still weren't there, so uh, we'll, we started with a, the toy model, and we'll continue with the toy model, and then we'll see the equations of motion for the, for the photons. And uh, once we're done with that, so this is the primary anisotropies continued, I'll eventually uh, so this will eventually get us to a place where we know how to compute the angular power spectrum or we have an idea how to compute the angular power spectrum so we'll be able to uh, in principle generate these curves the 2 pi and then L uh, and then in the second part of the talk I'll start discussing the measurements so then we'll try to understand what all the, the data points actually are and how they're derived and we'll see how we derive parameter constraints from it. So I'll talk about likelihoods and so on. Okay. Um, so now let's go back uh, to where we ended the, the last lecture and just briefly review. So we're trying to describe this, this toy model. So we had a, a toy model of uh, free massless particles in flat space, and we'll uh, get rid of these assumptions one by one. So we'll eventually go to... Uh, curved space and do perturbation theory in uh, uh, general relativity and we'll make them interacting. Uh, but for now, let's go back to the toy model and we saw that it's convenient to describe the, the system in terms of the, the phase space density, which satisfies a simple collisionless Boltzmann equation. And if you have a detector and you're trying to understand the, uh, the measure the, the temperature perturbations in the, in the system, it's convenient to, to define uh, this quantity. So this is essentially the density contrast. So you can think of it as delta rho over rho or the contribution of delta rho over rho from photons with uh, momenta with direction p hat. So this is the, the quantity we introduced. And hopefully it's more or less clear what it is, but it's really just the delta t over t up to a factor of four measured at position x in direction uh, n hat, so some direction n hat, which is minus p hat. So this is the, the quantity we introduced. And then uh, we saw that it satisfied a very simple differential equation that it inherits from the collisionless Boltzmann equation. And uh, we saw that because of translational invariance, it's convenient to look for uh, solutions that look like this, so Fourier, uh, Fourier solutions. And we briefly discussed what the, the physics of this equation is, why there is this appearance of the, the Q dot P, what it means. 
And then we saw that what we eventually want to compute, or we know that what we eventually want to compute for the cosmic microwave background are these angular power spectra or the multiple coefficients. And for that, it's convenient to decompose this, uh, this quantity in terms of Legendre polynomials, and you end up uh, with these coefficients, the, the, I guess, transfer functions. And in terms of these transfer functions, the multiple coefficients we saw just take uh, this form, where alpha now are some stochastic uh, parameters that we'll say a little bit more about, but you have some stochastic parameters that encode the initial conditions. So the equations were rotationally invariant, so you can always find solutions that only depend on the, on the magnitude, but the initial conditions, just like the, the solutions that Enrico was writing down, uh, will have to have some piece that keeps track of the directional dependence. It's just the initial conditions in my case. And I'll assume, or they're normalized in, in this case, in a way that alpha of Q, alpha star of Q prime is 2 pi cubed uh, delta of Q minus Q prime. So I'm assuming that my system, at least statistically, is uh, isotropic. And then you can go from here and compute the angular power spectra just by taking the ensemble average of the A, uh, ATLMs that I'm giving you, ATLM prime star. This is the, the angular power spectra we're interested in. So TTL uh, delta L, L prime, delta M, M prime. And if you compute this using this ensemble average, then you see that the angular correlation, uh, uh, angular power spectrum is a very simple function of these, of these transfer functions. So you're just really integrating the square of these transfer functions over the momenta. So this is why they are convenient. And from what we've done now, these quantities we, we saw, they satisfy uh, a coupled system of uh, ordinary differential equations. And similar equations, I haven't talked yet about polarization, but similar equations apply for polarization where you just replace the T by, by P. So are there other questions about uh, the various steps? So there's a lot of algebra and introduction of lots of new quantities, but hopefully it's somewhat clear why we're introducing them and what we've introduced. Is it, does it make sense? If you have questions about it, now is maybe a good time to ask. Okay, so if it's clear, then we'll keep going and move on beyond our little toy model. And the first way we'll generalize it is by uh, allowing for interactions between the particles. And then this is perhaps easier to see from the Boltzmann equation. I mean, you might know that if you have a Boltzmann equation, so the number density of particles, it, it satisfies for our massless guys, satisfies this equation. And then you will have a, a collision term on the, on the other side. And it will describe, uh, if we're interested in the um, contribution of photons with momentum p hat that are coming to us, there will be two contributions. One of them is when things get scattered out of the line of sight. The other one, when things get scattered into the line of sight. And if you run this through the derivations that we did, then you find that they just show up on the, on the right-hand side in this way. It's not so surprising that to see this term, this is the term that corresponds to scattering things out of the line of sight. And then the term that scatters things into the line of sight is an integral over different angles. And so it will be a functional of various of these multiples. And exactly which multiples appear here will be uh, depending on the interactions we are having. So here, I'm assuming that we have a, an interaction that's similar to, to Compton scattering, in which case you have delta 0 and delta 2 appearing. But in principle, these are the, the collision terms uh, that appear. And even if you have these collision terms turned on, what's nice about this equation is that you can write a, a formal solution for it. So this is a, uh, still this, the homogeneous solution you can solve. And then you can write down a solution, a formal solution for the inhomogeneous equation. I call it formal because the right-hand side 
involves the things that you're trying to solve for. So this is clearly uh, not immediately useful, but you see that it will be useful because it's only the lowest L that actually appear here in the, in the collision terms. And so we don't have to solve the, the full hierarchy that we had on the previous slide, but in practice we can uh, solve for the lowest few multiples to, to get them accurately and then use this line of sight solution to get the, the full function. So we'll, we'll see that in, in slightly more detail, but this is referred to as the, the line of sight integral because you're really essentially integrating or solving the uh, equation by integrating along the line of sight. Uh, does that make sense? We'll see it again for the, for the photons in a little bit more uh, detail and we'll see how the hierarchy, uh, what the hierarchy is, how it truncates. Uh, but for now, so if this makes sense, I'll move on and, and include the general relativistic uh, effects from the, the perturbations in the metric. Okay, so uh, to include the, the perturbations, is relatively simple. Everything works as before, so you have the, the phase space density. The only thing you now have to be a little bit careful about, so you're not picking up uh, metrics or inverse metrics and so on, or, or uh, determinants of the, the metric, is to have uh, where you put your indices. So for the coordinates, we have upper indices. For the momenta, we have lower indices. Then the phase space density is still of this form and you can derive equations of motion for it in the same way we did before. So you compute the partial derivative with respect to time, and then it acts on this piece, uh, which gives you a contribution that looks similar to before, except now the dxi by dr is pi over p0. So this is what the uh, momentum uh, is for the, for the particles in, in general relativity. And then for the momentum, the derivative with respect to momentum uh, looks like this. So these are the, the geodesic equations that we had in one of the earlier lectures. And so you just uh, put it together. So this is the, the term, we ha uh, the partial derivative with respect to time. This is the piece you get from the action on the coordinates of the, the particles. And you see that this resembles the piece we had before. So you have the PK divided by the energy. So this is still just the, the, directional, uh, the, the direction of the momentum. And then uh, this term looks slightly more complicated, but it's just because the, the particle has to move along to D6. So this is the collisionless Boltzmann equation part. And then in general, there will be collisions just in the, in the same way we discussed. Some of the things get scattered out of our line of sight. Some of them get scattered into the line of sight. Um, does that make sense? So. Okay, and so if you then go through all the, the same gymnastics, so you introduce again the, the delta of uh, T as an integral of P cubed dP of the perturbation to this uh, phase space density um, and from the delta T of X and P, you Fourier transform and expand it in terms of Legendre polynomials. So going through the same exact steps, you get a, a Boltzmann hierarchy for the photons that looks like this. And you should be able to recognize most of the pieces because we've seen them before. So in our toy model, we had exactly the same piece here. So this is still uh, true for the, for the photons in uh, the, uh, in a perturbed FRW universe. Then here we see the, the scattering uh, contribution or the, the collision term. And then there's additional pieces that are uh, from, the, from the collisions. These are from the uh, omega. I mean, omega is the rate at which scattering occurs. So this is the an, an, an number density of free electrons times the, the Thomson cross-section cross times the speed of light which I didn't put on this slide, but so this is what the, the frequency here is. And then uh, you see this piece. Uh, these are the metric perturbations that we introduced. I don't know if uh, you still remember them. Enrico also introduced them, but we had the, the metric perturbations. So delta gij, we said, was a squared and then 2a plus di dj, b, and then plus vectors and tensors. 
And so these are the, the pieces. Sorry, there's a delta ij here. So these are the metric perturbations that appear, and they're the ones that uh, tell the photons how to move uh, along geodesics. And then there's a similar term for the, for the polarization. So this is the uh, piece that keeps track of the polarization for the photons. And again, there's the, the collision terms. And one interesting thing that you, that you see is that the polarization, so maybe let's take one step back and just look at this system of equations at very early times when the collision rate is high. Uh, I'll say it again in, in more detail in the next lecture, but let's look at it in the limit where the collision rate is large. And let's look at uh, L larger than, than two for a second. And let's look at, uh, well, let's look at polarization first. So if you look at polarization, when omega uh, is large, this will exponentially suppress the, the polarization. So the solution to this equation will exponentially suppress the, uh, the multiples for the, for the polarization because you see that here there's a factor of a half, so you partially cancel this for delta P0 and delta P2, but overall there's always some exponential suppression of polarization. And the only thing that leads to polarization is the, the temperature quadrupole, if you want. So this is the, the part that actually will eventually, when scattering becomes inefficient, these are the pieces that lead to the, the generation. But early on, uh, there's no polarization uh, in the plasma, and you only generate polarization through these terms, in particular the, the temperature quadrupole. And it's, it's uh, intuitively clear why the temperature quadrupole generates uh, polarization. So you might, uh, so if you look at uh, um, one of our, the configuration that we had with our wave uh, crests, um, you, let's say there's a, a hot part over here and a hot part over here and in between it's cooler, then if I'm looking at this, uh, at this region and there's photons scattering off from, so photons coming in from the hotter part of the plasma and scattering into my line of sight, then you know that uh, the polarization of the photon I'm observing is predominantly in the transverse to the plane in which the scattering occurs. So you're scattering in this plane and you polarize the photon in, in this direction. Similarly, for the photons that scatter from, uh, from this direction, you will see them polarized in, in this direction. And because it's hotter, the intensity, so you have some amount of intensity. Now you also have photons that scatter from the, the cooler parts. If you have a photon that scatters from below, it will be polarized in this direction, uh, whereas the ones that scattered from, uh, from the sides were polarized in this direction. And because the intensity of the, the photons or the energy density in the photons is uh, smaller here than it is here, you uh, end up with a net polarization. So there's more polarization in this direction than there is in, in, in this direction. Uh, does that make sense? I mean, this is for the quadrupole. I can, if it's too much waving hands, I can try to draw a, a cartoon on the board. But it's essentially what I'm saying is if I look face on at a, a pattern, a density pattern that looks like this, and I'm looking at it, and there's a, an electron here, the intensity uh, of the radiation I'm observing that's polarized in this direction is larger because it's hotter than the intensity that I'm observing in this direction. So there's some net polarization that's generated from a quadrupole, whereas that's not the case if you have a, a monopole, so if uh, a dipole, sorry. For the monopole, certainly it's not true because the radiation from everywhere is the same, so the monopole certainly doesn't generate polarization. It's also not true if you have uh, a dipole. If you look at this situation, then uh, there's some uh, additional uh, intensity from here, but you're exactly making it uh, making up for it on this side. So here you also have no no net polarization. You end up with a, a unpolarized radiation. So it's really the quadrupole that generates the the polarization in this case. And then we'll look at this system of equations in a little bit more uh, detail tomorrow in the last lecture. But for now, I just wanted to show you the system of equations, and then we'll see the, the rest of the system of equations, and we'll know what the system of equations are we're trying to solve with the, the Boltzmann codes.
and then tomorrow we'll try to look at analytic uh, solutions. So the components that should be familiar to you are from the stress tensor are the delta T sub zero. So this is the, just the density contrast at that place. It's just the, the average version. Then the, the dipole is the velocity potential. And then the, there is also, in principle, the anisotropic stress, or delta T2, which corresponds to the anisotropic stress and to, to pressure. At early times, um, as I said, and as we'll see in more detail tomorrow, Compton scattering is very efficient. So you have uh, a, a, um, a scattering rate that's much larger than Hubble, and you're driving to zero, as we said, all the, the polarization pieces, and you're also driving to zero all the pieces with multiples greater than or equal to two in the temperature. And this means that what is left is a system of equations of hydrodynamics. So you just end up with energy conservation and momentum conservation in the uh, baryon photon plasma. And so this is why you can actually make some progress in finding analytic solutions. So in, in that regime, you can then, for example, if you're only interested in the temperature perturbations, you can uh, solve that system of equations and just assume that you describe the fluid as a hydro, uh, hydrodynamically all the way until last scattering and then just track it from last scattering. But the codes really just solve the full system of, of coupled equations. There's a similar system of equations for the neutrinos. If you treat them as massless, if you treat them as massive, it gets a little bit more complicated. So here I'm just writing a system of equations for the massless neutrinos. So you see that they're uh, just like our massless particles in the, in the toy example, except for the appearance of the, the metric perturbations, which will tell them how to move along, along geodesics. And then for the baryons, the equations are very simple. You just have uh, energy conservation, uh, which takes this form, and momentum conservation uh, with, uh, between the, the baryons and the photons. And for the dark matter, again, you just have energy conservation. This is in, in synchronous gauge. There's nothing to be said about the momentum conservation because synchronous gauge, so we fixed, uh, we got rid of the two scalar perturbations uh, in, the, in the metric in H00 and in H0i. Um, and uh, there's an additional residual gauge uh, redundancy in, in the synchronous gauge, which allows you to gauge fix to zero the velocity potential of the cold dark matter. So this is just zero, which just really means that all the velocity potentials you're writing for the baryons and so on are measured with respect to the, uh, to the, to the dark matter. So this is the only equation that you have to care about for the, for the dark matter. It just has to conserve uh, energy density and uh, energy and then in the, for the metric perturbations, it's somewhat up to you. I mean, there's uh, some choice of which equations you like. I'm writing two linearly independent equations that you can uh, use to, to solve. And this is the, the system of equations that's in the code. So uh, if, for example, if you want to now uh, look at some, uh, some, some applications that you might want to do is you might want to study, let's say, what happens if the dark matter decays into dark radiation, then you might want to have a term here on the, on the other side that tells you that the dark matter decays into something else, and you might want to include another copy of the Boltzmann equations that for the dark radiation would look a lot like the neutrinos, unless you're trying to keep track of the polarization, then you would look uh, also keep track. Uh, I don't know why you would keep track of the polarization of the dark radiation, but anyway, I mean, so there's... Uh, if you want to do modifications, you modify these equations in the codes and then just, just run them. But these are the kind of equations that are solved in the codes. And then the question is, uh, what are the, the initial conditions? So these are the, the equations we're trying to solve. Now the question is, what are the initial conditions we're trying to solve? And um, if you go back in time, so today, obviously, all the modes we're observing by definition are inside the horizon. We can't measure things that are larger than, than the horizon or than, than Hubble. Um, but uh, 
uh, we're looking at modes that are inside the horizon today. If you extrapolate them backwards, they, they grow. So K over A, uh, obviously redshifts like uh, 1 over A or grows like 1 over A. At the same time, if you look at the, the Hubble rate, Hubble goes like, uh, uh, Hubble always goes like uh, 1 over T. In the radiation dominated era, uh, you have a uh, scale factor that grows uh, like uh, T to the 1 half. So you get a Hubble that goes like 1 over A squared. In the matter dominated epoch, you have A goes like T to the 2 thirds, so a, a Hubble decays like 1 over A to the 3 halves. In both cases, as you go backwards in time, it grows more rapidly than the, the momenta grow. And so as you go back in time, all the modes we observe today are outside the horizon. So by that I mean that the physical momentum Q over A is much less than Hubble if you go back to uh, early enough times. And this is nice in a sense because the system of equations there becomes very simple and you can actually work out the, the initial conditions uh, analytically. So as I already said, the system of equations at early times uh, really reduces to, to that of, of hydrodynamics and you can look for solutions of, of this form and in, in more detail if you want to look at them in terms of the quantity that Enrico also defined, this uh, curly R uh, which is the same, same as his notation, so it's A over 2 plus H delta U, except uh, I'm using the velocity potential and the velocity potential for a single scalar field is minus, Enrico called it phi for the perturbations, and then phi dot. And so you see that you get the, the same quantity uh, that Enrico had. For now, this is really just the initial condition of my system of equations, though at, 10 to the, at less than 10 to the 9 Kelvin. So I'm not yet talking about inflation. I'm just uh, trying to work out what the initial conditions are uh, for my system of equations below 10 to the 9 uh, Kelvin. And you find, as Enrico also explained, that there is a solution that's constant outside the horizon for, for R or a solution for which R is constant outside the horizon becomes a constant. And in terms of this constant, you can analytically work out these, uh, the various uh, quantities that appear in our system of equations. And then with this system of equations, you can uh, run them forward. You can, in principle, implement them in Mathematica if you feel like it and feel like doing the exercise. It will be very slow, so people have Fortran codes. And the, the Fortran codes really solve exactly the, the system of equations I wrote down for you. And uh, once you know the uh, delta T sub L, you know what the angular power spectra are. So this is the, the code uh, called CAMP. And then there's another code called CLASS. And depending on this code, is, is written in Fortran. It's still used very widely. Uh, this one is uh, written in, in C or C++, so it depends a little bit on, on what you like better. But in principle, you can use both of these codes to compute the angular power spectra. And if you have models of new physics that you're trying to study, let's say you have interactions between the baryons and the dark matter, you can modify them and just run the angular power spectra, compute them and compare to the, to the CMB uh, data. So now, so far, We've done EV physics, as Enrico also was pointing out in his, uh, in his first lecture. And so now the question is, how do we go or why do we claim that we can learn something about the, the very early universe from it? So now we're trying to understand why the initial conditions we're imposing here have anything to do with the very early universe. And... Here what I'm showing you is the formula for the angular power spectrum. So these were our transfer functions that we had earlier. I'm just breaking them up for, uh, for reasons. Um, so, I mean, there's really two physical contributions to the transfer functions. On the one hand, there's, this is the, the physics of recombination, if you want. These are the source functions. This is the baryon photon plasma and so on. 
and then there's another piece that's just doing a, a projection from the plane waves onto whatever uh, the uh, onto the uh, onto the sphere, and this will depend on the geometry. So if you in a uh, flat, spatially flat universe, the functions, the special functions up here are the spherical Bessel functions. If you wanted to do the computation in an open or a closed universe, it would be slightly uh, different. But so there's this piece. This is the, the late time evolution. And then these are the initial conditions. So they factorize in a nice way at, at linear order in, in perturbation theory. And so far, they're the initial conditions for the equations below 10 to the 9 uh, Kelvin, and um, I didn't go through it. We can maybe look at it in the in the next lecture. But you can somehow you can uh, really analytically find the the solution, and you see that the system of equations that I wrote down has five solutions that don't decay. So there are some that decay. You don't so much care about them because they will become subdominant uh, compared to the ones that don't decay. And you have uh, one adiabatic solution and you have four that are called isocurvature solutions. And I won't say much about the isocurvature perturbations because experimentally uh, only the, the adiabatic solution seems excited. And that's the solution for which R is constant. The fact that R is constant uh, in these is very helpful um, because it allows you to extrapolate backward in time. So no matter how early you go, uh, this quantity R is constant. Now, the only caveat is that eventually the system of equations I was writing for which I said that R, there was a solution with constant R when the modes are outside the horizon, eventually the system of equations will break down if I go to high enough temperatures where I have electrons and positrons in thermal equilibrium, and then eventually I will have the, the quark-gluon plasma and so on. But it turns out that essentially for a, for a general matter content, this, this quantity R, is th there's always a solution for which uh, R is, is constant. So this is the, the theorem that Enrico was referring to and uh, sketched for you how you would uh, show it. This is uh, uh, true for very, very general matter content. And so in principle, you can extrapolate backwards even through epochs for which you don't really know uh, what, the, what the physics is. So on the one hand, this is good because you can go back in time. On the other hand, it's not so good because these super Hubble perturbations are not something that you can generate causally. And so this is uh, why. So what you need is in this picture, you, you know that eventually you want something that uh, makes K over A as you go back in time, grow more rapidly than, than Hubble. So you want this quantity, the time derivative of Q over A uh, the, times the magnitude of H to be less than zero. And there's two ways to do it. So the first uh, way to do it is if you have uh, an expanding universe, so H is positive, then this will just be D by DT of one over A dot has to be less than zero. Q is positive, so it just tells you that d by dt of 1 over a dot has to be less than 0, which is the same as saying that a double dot has to be positive. So you have a, an expanding, accelerated expansion, which we typically call inflation. The other option is to have a, a negative Hubble, in which case you have a decelerating uh, contraction. So these are the two uh, ways to, to get out of it. So you can inflate, or you can try to, to bounce. And the picture then for the uh, inflationary uh, paradigm that Enrico is describing is, uh, looks like this. So it's, I'm drawing the picture in a slightly different way, but Enrico has drawn the same, same picture uh, uh, with somewhat different things on, on the axis. For example, for him it was 1 over uh, k, and the, the scale factor wasn't in there, and so on. But it's conceptually the same. So the idea is that you have the quantum fluctuations that he was describing to you, generating the, the perturbations deep inside the horizon. So you have these fluctuations in your, in your clock field. And as the universe expands and uh, the, the perturbations get stretched and eventually freeze out. You saw it in Enrico's mode functions. And they become, uh, you approach in the single field models a solution where R is constant. And if you approach that solution, it will remain constant, essentially no matter what happens uh, 
to the, to the matter in, in between, so it doesn't matter what happens at reheating, which is good because we don't really know what happened at reheating, but it's this conservation law that uh, guarantees that we can still use this to, to extrapolate to lower energies. You don't know how, let's say, the dark matter decouple. There's lots of physics, potentially unknown physics, in between here, but we don't care because we have this, uh, this conservation law, at least in the uh, single field models. And so it, it's true more generally, I guess, that whenever there's a, you get into the mode where R is constant, doesn't matter if it was single field inflation or any other uh, process you think about, that then you stay in that solution because it's a solution of the equations of motion. The, the two cases that we know where this is an attractor is in the single field inflation, just because we know there's always two adiabatic modes, one of the constant ones, the other one decaying. So you have to have, I mean, you only have two degrees of freedom in the single field inflation, so you have to excite that mode. The other case is where you have a phase of thermal equilibrium without any uh, conserved charges. And so in, in those uh, scenarios, at least, the anisotropies that we see in the B, C and B directly tell us about the inflationary dynamics because they allow you to compute the quantity, the curly R, and this quantity, you can compute it during inflation. It's conserved all the way uh, to temperatures below 10 to the 9 Kelvin where you use it as the initial conditions for the system of equations uh, that I was writing. Does that make sense? And this is just what Enrico wrote down uh, at the end of, of his lecture, uh, even in the same conventions, which is good. <laughs> anyway, except here I have delta, which is the fractional rate of change of H dot. Enrico wrote it in terms of eta, which is the fractional rate of change of, of epsilon. But this is the, the prediction for the uh, primordial power spectrum for the for the scalars uh, in in inflation, and the additional prediction for the single field Laurel models is that the three point function uh, and non Gaussianity in general is too small to be observed. So these are the predictions, and you can feed them into the uh, into the code, compute the angular power spectrum, and this is what gives you the the red line. Uh, so ho hopefully you have. Well, we'll see a little bit more analytically what you can do and uh, what's the, the physics uh, of these equations. But for now, I just wanted to show you the equations, show you what the, the codes are. If any of you have used them and you have problems with, with them, I guess you can, uh, you can ask. But in, in principle, uh, this is how you would generate the red line. So you run one of these codes with your favorite initial conditions. Maybe you modify some of the equations if you want to study some new physics. Um, and this gives you, so, and now the next part will be to understand how we actually make the, the data points. So how you actually do the, the CMB measurement. Okay, and before we talk about measuring the CMB, let's just look at some of the maps because it's, it's quite obvious that they're not really, uh, the CMB experiments are not really <laughs> measuring just the CMB, but they measure all kinds of things that are in the sky. They just are uh, uh, experiments that map the sky at a range of frequencies. For Kobe DMR, for example, it was at 31, 53, and 91 gigahertz. And then you, you still, I mean, here you have fairly noisy maps. You mostly see the galaxy. As you go to W map, W map mapped the sky at, at five frequencies over nine years from 2001 to 2010. And you see the K band at 23 gigahertz. Then there's the KA band, uh, Q band, V band, and W band. And you see that a lot of what you're seeing is not the, you see a fair amount of primary anisotropies, but you also see a fair amount of other stuff. In this case, synchrotron emission. And that at 100 gigahertz, you're starting to see some dust. Um, but there's, there's other things in the, in the maps, and we'll talk a little bit about them, but not, not too much. Here's the maps from the Planck uh, satellite. So Planck mapped the sky at nine frequencies between 30 gigahertz uh, and 857 gigahertz. It's really broken up into two experiments, two different uh, technologies. So there was the Planck LFI, uh, 
measurement from 30 to 70 gigahertz and the Planck HFI measurement from 100 gigahertz to 857 gigahertz. LFI stands just for low frequency instrument. HFI stands for high frequency instrument. At low frequencies, it was radiometers, which is similar to the technology WMAP used. At high frequencies, it's a bolometer detector. So these are the, these are the maps. And you see that uh, as you go up in frequency, you start to see a lot of dust, for example, at 217 gigahertz. This map, you can make a, a map that looks much nicer, but I'm just showing you on the same scale how dusty it is at 353 gigahertz, and then the scales change for the 545 gigahertz and 857 gigahertz. And so in addition to CMB, there's a lot of stuff in the maps that you actually have to understand at least at some level and take out if you want to learn about the CMB. So there's the, the dust emission from dust grains in our galaxy. There's emission from, uh, from so synchrotron emission from electrons in the magnetic field of our galaxy. And then there's also some things that are actually uh, interesting. So some people also find these interesting in their own right. I don't know if you like... Uh, uh, I mean, in principle, you can study the, the physics of dust grains, how they align with the magnetic field, what the composition is, the distribution, the size distribution of these things. Uh, for the CMB measurements, they're really just a, a nuisance. But there are some other things that are still interesting to, to probe cosmology. You can learn about the late, uh, late universe. I mean, there's some information about reionization because some of the photons... Uh, don't I mean that come to us from the last scattering surface? They rescatter from uh, electrons after the universe becomes reionized. So when the first stars form, they uh, ionize the the universe or reionize the universe, and some of the photons scatter from them again. Then there's also the the thermal sonyaev seldovich effect, which I'll briefly show. There's the the kinetic sonyaev seldovich effect. Uh, lensing, which I'll briefly say a few words about. So there's a, a number of things in the, yeah? Where is it mostly coming from? It's all, I mean, the dust I'm talking about here, or what I call dust, is all dust from our galaxy. And then, obviously, the, if you look at the maps, most of the emission is in the, in the galactic plane, but even at high latitudes, there is some emission from, from galactic dust. So there's Basically, no region where you don't see any galactic dust. I mean, even at, at high latitudes. So basically, over the full sky, there's some emission from, from thermal dust. So these are... Uh -huh. I mean, if you, if you look e even in the, well, in solar system, it's maybe it gets pushed out, but so there's, uh, dust is really a somewhat broad uh, term for uh, anything that's larger than, uh, so there's the polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which are maybe at the, at the lower end of the, the spectrum in terms of the sizes. So these are just large molecules. And then it goes up to, I mean, let's say typically you have some, some micron size dust grains. They could be silicates, there could be some uh, uh, iron inclusions, they could be, could be made from all kinds of uh, things, but typically they're from carbon or from, from silica, uh, silicates. And they're just leftover things, I mean, from stars that exploded and, and so on. So it's just material that's, that's left uh, out there. And they also have different uh, dust grain geometries. And uh, I don't know if we want to talk too much about dust. But the, I mean, the, the reason it's a nuisance is because it also uh, emits polarized uh, uh, radiation. And this is because it actually aligns with the magnetic fields. Exactly how it happens, I, I'm not sure it's completely understood. But one of the ideas, at least, is that you have some dust grains that have an irregular shape, and they get hit by light that's coming from, from stars and it makes them spin. And if you have a spinning particle, so you, uh, a spinning particle you induce a, a dipole moment and the dipole moment makes it precess around the magnetic field and eventually it will lose some, some energy and align further and further with the magnetic field. And then you have these parts of the, uh, you have these dust uh, grains that are aligned with the magnetic field and they, 
predominantly uh, absorb and emit in the longer direction, I guess. Is, uh, yeah, so you see, yeah? Sorry? This is all galactic foregrounds. This is all dust. I mean, there are some parts where you see a little bit of yellow shining through. This is what the, where the CMB is. So there's some CMB at 353 gigahertz, but it's mostly dust that you see at 353 gigahertz. <clears throat> okay, so now let's the, the first effect I wanted to maybe at least say one or two words about but not, not too much either. So the thermals in the I.F. Sildovich effect arises because of uh, scattering of the photons of hot electrons in the clusters. So if you have a, a, a cluster somewhere and then you have the, the CMB that's emitted and then you, you're observing it, uh, there will be uh, an effect where some of the uh, CMB photons scatter out of the line of sight, so some of the photons that you would have seen naively scatter out of the line of sight, and then there will be also effects where some of the uh, photons will scatter uh, into the line of sight, and they scatter off hot electrons in the gas, so there's electrons at some, uh, some temperature, and this leads to a, a spectral distortion, so you're upscattering the, the photons, and you can uh, compute it. It looks like this. It's just proportional, again, to the number density of electrons and their, uh, and their temperature. So what you can do is you can make a map of what is called the, the Compton Y parameter, which tells you about the hot gas uh, between us and the, the surface of last scattering. And this effect um, you can see in the map. So as I said, there's this... Uh, this shape, so this is what's shown here, so this is the, uh, the function you saw on the previous slide, and the, at low frequencies, what you expect is, if you're looking in the direction of a cluster, is that the CMB in that direction actually looks colder, because uh, you see this, this deficit here, you see it at 44 gigahertz, 70 gigahertz, 143 gigahertz, and then, so you see how it becomes uh, colder and colder, and then uh, at 217 gigahertz, you expect to see nothing. So there's the thermal scenario of Seldovich effect here predicts a, a zero, and this is why a lot of CMB experiments actually have a frequency in that range. So for example, Planck has the 217 gigahertz band, there's ACT and so on have uh, 220 gigahertz channels. This is because you want to actually measure the thermal scenario of Seldovich effect, so you want to have one channel where you don't see it, and then other channels where you do see something, and you can measure the spectrum. So you see that you need at least two of them, because otherwise you couldn't tell if it's just a CMB fluctuation. But if you have one channel where you don't expect the SE effect, and then channels where you do see a, a deficit or decrement in the temperature, you can actually extract it. And for Planck, what's nice is that you also have um, uh, channels above uh, the 217 gigahertz where the clusters show up as hotter than, uh, than below. So um, uh, this is how it shows up in the map. So you really, by eye, clearly see the, the decrement and then the, the increment. Now, from the ground, it's difficult to do these measurements because you only really have four atmospheric windows. So you can measure uh, at around 40 gigahertz, uh, 90 gigahertz, 150 gigahertz, and 220 gigahertz. But these, this, uh, these high frequencies, at least, you can only do either from, from space or from balloons. But this is a nice example of the SE effect. And you can use it just in your maps. You look for these kind of uh, point sources where you have a decrement at low frequencies and an increment at high frequencies, and you can uh, map out all the clusters. So this is a map of the SC clusters in the Planck map. So you see that you're detecting a fair number of them, and in principle, you can do cosmology with it. You can look at the number counts. They will be very sensitive to sigma 8 and so on. Or you can make uh, a Compton Y map. So this is not just the clusters, but it's really the, the Compton uh, 
uh, y map. So you make a, a, param a, a map of this Compton y parameter that I showed earlier. And then you can try to measure the, the power spectrum of it. So you can, in principle, also do cosmology with the normalization of the thermal SE effect. And all these small scale um, measurements, I mean, will be more and more prominent because there will be lots of experiments over the next few years that will measure the, the CMB at high resolution. So you can do a lot of uh, TSC and KSC, and you can also do a lot of interesting things with the, with the lensing. So if you imagine that the CMB is uh, emitted at some uh, fixed, fixed redshift, I mean, to good approximation, that's what's happening, then if you have a lens somewhere along the, maybe not along the line of sight, but just next to your line of sight, you actually uh, don't see the temperature of the CMB in, uh, of the primary anisotropies exactly in that direction, but you see the unlensed CMB shifted by the uh, derivative of the uh, lensing uh, potential, which is, uh, yeah, so, uh, it so intuitively should be clear if you have a cluster, the light uh, will be deflected by the, by the cluster. And this has a number of effects on the cosmic microwave background. So one of them is that it washes out the, well, maybe not washes out, but it uh, somewhat smoothes the peaks in the angular power spectrum. And this is something that's included in all the analyses. So let me briefly describe what the effect is. So let's imagine you're trying to measure the angular power spectrum in some direction of the sky, and there's some lens that magnifies the CMB. Then if the primary uh, CMB anisotropies have a power spectrum, uh, so this is L times L plus 1 over 2 pi times the L, and then this is L. So if your primary anisotropies, or the, the theory input, have some power spectrum that looks like this, if you have a lens that magnifies the CMB, it means that you're shifting everything to somewhat larger angular scales or lower L, so you get something that will look like this. Uh, this is obviously an extreme uh, version. And then you might have a place where you demagnify the CMB, so you're moving it to higher L. So these are, if you were to imagine measuring it in, in small patches. And then what you're doing with the full sky measurement is you're averaging over all these patches. And so you see that if you're averaging these curves, then you're filling in the, the minima a little bit and you're smoothing out the, the maxima a little bit. Uh, this is the, the basic effect of the peak smearing from, from lensing. Um, in addition, the lensing leads to uh, three-point correlation. So there is some non-Gaussianity in the, in the CMB maps, just not the kind we're usually interested in for inflation, but there are correlations, uh, three-point correlations in the CMB because the, the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect, which arises from the time variation of the gravitational potentials and the lensing, which arises from the spatial derivatives, are correlated because of the, the equations of motion. And this is something that's always subtracted in the three-point analyses of, of Planck. So this effect is taken out. This also taken into account. And then the four point, the, at four points, you also have a, a non-trivial four-point function that you can use to measure the lensing power spectrum. So the four-point function has this uh, schematic form. So there's, it's proportional to the temperature power spectrum squared and the, the lensing power spectrum. And you can use this to measure the lensing power spectrum. And you've probably seen the, the plots from Planck. And it's detected at very high significance. So it's depending exactly on how you count. It's detected at around uh, 40 sigma. You see the different Planck measurements, 2013, 2015, and the ACT and SPT measurements. There's still some, some issues in the measurements. So usually it's cut off somewhere here because some of the null tests are failing at, uh, at high L. But it's a very nice measurement of the uh, lensing power spectrum. So you can really generate uh, a map of the mass between, or uh, the matter between us and the surface of less scattering. 
and this uh, map of the lensing potential is what I'm showing here. So the gray is obviously just the galaxy that's being masked because there's too much dust to do the reconstruction. But you see <coughs> that you now have a, a Kobe-like, let's call it, Kobe-like map of the matter between us and the surface of last scattering. And this will get much better with uh, future uh, experiments. So there will be a number of experiments, ground-based, uh, that will make very nice uh, lensing maps. OK, so this is what I wanted to say about the, the things that are not primary anisotropies. And now I'll say a few words about actually measuring the angular, angular power spectrum. Yeah? Um, I'm not sure exactly if there's anything specifically interesting about the point that L equals 100, but I can try to look at it. I, I, I haven't looked at the, the point at L of 100. I mean, it's only, I mean, it's not a highly significant difference, but it's maybe worth checking what actually happened here. I, I haven't looked into it, so I don't know. Sorry? Yeah. I don't know. I should check. But uh, so it doesn't. At least it doesn't fail. The, the down here, everything looks under control. Where the problems are still in the lensing measurement is out here. So there's some null tests, and that it fails. For example, you see a, a curl which you should not see from from lensing out at, at high L. So uh, I think the low L is under control. But it, it's worth maybe checking this. This I don't remember. So maybe one should ask someone who worked on it. But I don't remember. Any more questions? Yeah? How good are the Ah, so CAMP doesn't really generate maps. It just generates angular power spectra. So you tell CAMP what the cosmology is you would like to, to compute the angular power spectrum for. So you tell it what omega b is, what omega cold dark matter is, what the, the various parameters are uh, H0, tau, ns, and the, the amplitude of the, the scalar perturbations, let's say, something like this. And then it computes for you uh, the angular power spectra. So it gives for you this, uh, this plot. It, it computes the, the temperature anisotropies or the angular power spectrum of temperature anisotropies and also for the polarization. It doesn't really generate maps. In principle, if you want to generate maps, so these maps are not measurements, but these are maps that are just generated from a given uh, set of CLs. And if you want to do that, then you should use something that's called heel picks, which I didn't want to say much about it. But if you're interested, I, I can uh, tell you in uh, how I mean, where to find it and, and how to use it. But uh, CAMP really only generates angular power spectra. Um, but not maps. Yeah? Sorry, the ground-based experiments will be very good at measuring the clusters eventually because they have higher resolution than Planck. So they will actually do much better than Planck did for all the TSE, KSE. This is something that will get much better over the next few years with advanced ACT, SPT, and so on. They do have less frequency bands. The, the frequency bands, I'm not sure, will be so problematic for the uh, TSE but they will be problematic for things that I will talk about also tomorrow, not tomorrow, on Thursday, I think, for the, for the search for primordial gravitational waves. If you're trying to look for B modes, you really have to understand the, the foregrounds well. I, I don't think right now it's uh, holding up the TSE and KSE measurements because they typically right now do it with two frequency bands. And advanced act, for example, will have five. And then, I don't know, for CMB stage four, it's not yet clear what it will be, but right now we're typically discussing eight frequencies. So I, I think this, this kind of stuff will be done very well from the ground. Yeah?
from voids? You mean something that's not captured? I mean, I, as I said, there are some parts where you magnify, some parts where you demagnify the CMB. So this, in principle, captured, unless you somehow have something in mind that's beyond lambda CDM. But the kind of stuff that is in lambda CDM, voids or over densities, are, are both uh, included in the in the computations. More questions? Okay, so then let's talk a little bit about the measurement of the um, power spectra and the, the Planck analysis. And here I'm just showing you simulated maps just so we have an ideal measurement. So there's a, the temperature map, full sky temperature map, and then uh, full sky Q and U maps. And uh, what you do, as we said before, from the map you just compute your ALMs. Uh, this is also something you can do in, in heel picks if you want to do it in a practical way, you would do it in heel picks. And then given the ALMs, you can compute the angular power spectra in this way. And similarly, from Q and U, you can extract A, E, L, M, A, B, L, M, and you can compute all the cross spectra and power spectra in, in polarization from the maps. Now, the question is, let's say we have such an ideal measurement, how do we go about estimating the, the cosmological parameters in your, in your favorite model? So what you would like to know is the probability uh, distribution or the probability that uh, this, the universe is described by your model with some parameters theta. Uh, given the, the data. So the theta here really just is whatever parameters you need to describe your model. So for lambda CDM, you could use these six parameters. If you have some other model, it's theta just stands for whatever the parameters are in your model. And then the data, uh, D stands for the data for the CMB. It could be either the ALMs directly or the uh, angular power spectra. If you have uh, galaxy surveys, it could be the, the matter power spectrum or galaxy power spectrum and so on. And what you're interested in really is this probability, but it's not something that you can easily uh, compute directly, but you can, what you can do is you can use Bayes' theorem to relate it to the probability for finding the, the data given your uh, parameters. So this is something that you can easily compute. If you have a theory for any given set of parameters, you should be able to tell me how likely it is to find a, a certain um, uh, angular power spectrum. And then you divide by the um, uh, probability for the data, which you typically you don't know. So this is just what you need for, for Bayes' theorem. And then this quantity, the probability for finding the set of parameters that you, uh, you or the values of parameters you're using, this is referred to as the, the prior. And because you don't usually, or you don't know the denominator, you define a, a likelihood, which is just given by the probability for the data given the, the theory. So this is the kind of likelihood, and you should be able to compute it for any uh, model you have. And as a uh, warm-up, what we'll look at are just the temperature and isotropies, and then we'll add back the uh, polarization. So for the temperature and isotropies, what we said was that the ensemble average over the ALMs, uh, or ALM, A star, L prime, M prime, gives you the angular power spectrum times delta L, L prime, delta M, M prime, and uh, this means it's the, these are Gaussian random variables, and so the probability for finding a given set of ALMs uh, can be written in this way. So this is exact. It's just a Gaussian uh, probability distribution, and this is just there to, to properly normalize the probability distribution. You can convince yourself that you uh, get back this, uh, these correlations for the... Uh, for the ALMs for this probability. And so in this case, you can write down the exact likelihood. So this is for a given L. Uh, for the, the, like, the different Ls are statistically independent. So the likelihood is just the product over all the contributions for the individual Ls. So the exact likelihood in this case looks like this. Or if you want to write the likelihood for, uh, in terms of not the ALMs, but the CLs, 
you can just rewrite it. And so you move this up into the exponential by turning it into a log, and you get uh, something something like this. So you ch this comes from a, a change of, of variables um, because you were computing the probability for CLs here and here the probability for ALMs. So there's a change of variables. But these are the likelihoods either for the ALMs or for the CLs. And this is something that you can now compute because you know using CAMB you know how to compute this. So you can compute the likelihood and the probability for finding the ALMs or the, the CLs. This is for temperature. If you want to move on uh, you and include polarization, it's very simple. You just define a vector that includes the temperature, multiples, E modes, B modes, and then uh, can define the correlation of A with a dagger as CL delta LL prime delta MM prime. So this still has to be true because of rotational invariance. And then the CL is just the matrix of the various angular power spectra. So you have TT, TE, EE, and BB. And the exact likelihood then you can still easily write down. It's still Gaussian. It's just this of this form where now the uh, ALMs are, are these, uh, these things. So uh, I don't know. Does that make sense? I mean, this is the kind, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So CAMP computes uh, the the various power spectra. So it computes TT, TE, EE, uh, everything you want, BB, and then it also computes the phi phi and phi e, where this is the the lensing uh, potential. So it computes all those for you, and you can use them in the likelihood. So I, I didn't here include the lensing. In principle, you want to fold the you could fold the the lensing into this as well because you're measuring other modes. But these are the, the exact likelihoods that you would write if you include polarization. And the, this is for the uh, ideal measurement. If you have a real measurement, then obviously there's noise. You have finite resolution. You have the, the maps. Uh, are, uh, there's pixels that you have to take into account. There's pixel window functions. You have to mask the sky because there's the galactic plane. There's a lot of things that you have to take into account. A lot of this um, it, well, we'll see it's, it's easy in, in pixel space, um, but uh, so one thing that's useful to point out, which is related to what I was uh, starting to say, so the likelihoods that we were writing down are Gaussian for the ALMs, but not for the CLs, and so it's easy to incorporate all these effects in, in map space, where the likelihood is Gaussian, you have an exact likelihood, it's very easy to do it in map space. You just uh, look at the correlations in, in map space between different pixels, and you know what their covariance is. So these are the angular, uh, the correlation functions. This is the noise covariance matrix, which you know for the experiment. So in principle, in pixel space, you know this, and then it's easy to write down the probability distribution for the temperature in a given pixel. It just looks like this, and it's easy to, to generalize to, to polarization, obviously, in the same way we, we did that before. The, so you can write this down, and as I said, you can extend it to polarization. The problem is that if you wanted to do this for Planck, the maps in practice have 50 million pixels. So your covariance matrices, the matrices that you have to invert are 50 million by 50 million. And so in practice, this isn't really something that's feasible. So you have to find other ways to do this. And what is done is to uh, cut the likelihood into different pieces. So you use uh, a, a, a likelihood in map space for low L and then you use approximations, so the likelihood for the, for the CLs. Uh, so you use a likelihood that is called pseudo-CL likelihood. And one of the approximations that you can do, this is what Planck actually used in practice in their analysis, is to just say, well, we'll, we'll approximate the CLs as Gaussian. This isn't really true. They're distributed according to a chi-square distribution with 2L plus 1 degrees of freedom. But you know that at large L, at least, because of the central limit theorem, it will approach a, a Gaussian distribution. So for large L, uh, this is OK. For WMAP, added a term, a log normal piece, to correct for the non-Gaussianities and the likelihood. 
uh, Planck didn't, but most of it is really coming from very high L, where these effects presumably don't matter all that much. And so the covariance matrix here is evaluated for some fiducial cosmology, so you're not varying it. It's, it's some fiducial fixed cosmology. Typically what you do is you start with some cosmology that you think is probably roughly correct, and then you do the measurement and you just iterate. So you can just compute this covariance matrix a few times until you have something that's, uh, that's consistent. And the nice thing about this approximation and the covariance matrix is that you can compute it analytically even if you mask the sky and if you have noise. And I'll briefly show you the, uh, some of the things that go into it, although I'm not sure it's a good time in the evening at 5 p.m. But so there's these, uh, what you want to have, you have massed uh, sky maps, so you're really multiplying them by some weight function. Typically, for W map, the weight was either 0 or 1, 0 for the pixels you throw out, 1 for the ones you keep. Uh, for W map, it's slightly more uh, complicated. You apodize the mask, which means that it's actually a, a function that smoothly goes between 0 and 1, and so you have to take into account uh, this kind of weighting. But the maps that you're using, the mask maps, are weighted, ma of weighted maps or multiplied by some weights of the, the measured maps, and you can compute uh, angular uh, the multiple coefficients from these maps just in the same way. Uh, this is essentially here I'm just writing. This is the uh, little area of a pixel, the omega i. And so what I'm writing here is effectively a discretized version of the integral that we had before, y star lm of delta t n hat. So these are the a t LMs, and from them you can compute the pseudo uh, power spectra. Uh, these are not really directly related. I mean, they're not the, the power spectra you're interested in, but they're related to the power spectra you're interested in by what is called a, a mode coupling matrix, and then these are pixel window functions, and this is a, a beam uh, window function from the experiment. So there's a number of other pieces that go in, and then there's some some uh, noise. So um, this is, in any case, I'm just really trying to show you that in principle uh, it is straightforward to compute this and to extract this by inverting the mode coupling matrix. Um, if you then want to compute the uh, covariance matrix, you can, given what I just showed you on the previous slide, compute it analytically, and it looks like this. So it's a bit of a mess, but you can easily implement it. So this is just the various pieces that go in. If anyone is interested in it, I'm happy to talk about it more, but it's just to give you an idea what these things look like. So this is what's used in practice. It's an analytic approximation to the covariance matrix. And then typically these approximations that you're using, they fail in certain cases, so you then use simulations to improve them, but it's uh, based on a, on a covariance matrix. And so what you do, as I said before, you use hybrid likelihoods. So you use a, a pixel-based uh, likelihood on large angular scales. This is exact. Um, and uh, but very difficult, uh, very lengthy to evaluate, so use it at, at large angular scales. On small scales, you use the pseudo CL likelihood that we that we just described. Uh, so you stitch them together around maybe 32 or 50, depending on the exact analysis. So different analyses use uh, slightly different places where you stitch them together. Now, um, so. One, so now the question is, once you have a likelihood, how do you extract the cosmological parameters? And one of the, th the ways you could do it is to just evaluate the likelihood function on a grid. So for every, so you have a six-dimensional space, you could just break it up into uh, a grid and then just evaluate it, but it would take you 10 to the 6 evaluations if you just want 10 points in, in each direction, which isn't really enough. So that you have to evaluate the likelihood a, a large number of times. So typically, this is not what you do. And in particular, the problem is that there's lots of foreground parameters. So in, in Planck, for example, you typically have an additional 20 to 25 parameters that you have to marginalize over. So what you do is you typically use uh, Markov chain uh, Monte Carlos. This is, again, something that you can download. So 
I think the most common one is still Cosmo MC, uh, which I'm, I'm showing you the plot from the, the web page here. So if you type it in, you can find it and you can, you can play with it. And this is the, the piece that just evaluates the likelihood and uh, gives you back the, the parameter constraints. What it does is it uses typically a metropolis Hastings sampling, which uh, chooses some starting point in your parameter space and it computes the likelihood there. So you have your parameter space, let's just draw a two-dimensional, and then you just pick some, some random point. And then what you do is you pick another random point and compute the likelihood ratio. If the new point is more likely, then you stay there. If it's less likely, then you go there with probability uh, Epsilon, where epsilon is this likelihood ratio. So this is like a, a thermal process. So this is like an e to the uh, minus e over, over kT, some Boltzmann suppression. And so there's some temperature associated with them that you can in principle adjust. But it just jumps around and samples the, the distribution. It just repeat it until you have enough points. And with uh, if you run it for long enough, you can use it to uh, derive the usual uh, contours that, that people show. So you just then jump around and then there will be 68% uh, of the time you will be in some, some region and then 95% of the time you will be in this region and so on. So you can just then draw contours around the, all the based on the points that you've sampled from the distribution. And I wanted to say a few words about how the Planck angular power spectrum was measured, but maybe I'll end here. Oh, it's over, right? It's, I'm out of time. Huh? Yeah, but I have more stuff to say anyway, so I'll just continue in the next, in the next lecture maybe and, and end here.